This nugget is the first of two where I'm going to introduce specific agile development techniques, not specific Scrum, but things that all Scrum projects should consider. In this nugget, I'm going to introduce the concept of test-driven development, a very unique twist on development where we do the test case first, and then we write the code to prove to validate to ensure the test case passes. And to me the beauty of test driven development is it ensures we're writing only the code directly required to make sure the test case works and therefore we're ensuring that we're delivering only the very minimal compliance because the test cases is validating the business requirements and we're writing only the code to require the test cases to pass. We will discuss probably the most contentious and probably the most commonly known of all agile development techniques, which is pair programming, where we have two, two people on all code. One codes and the other inspects, and then they switch. And the principle behind pair programming is we will develop better, functional, reliable code because we have that continuous inspection, it's building the quality in. We will reintroduce an agile development technique we've talked about already in the previous nugget, which is refactoring, which is taking bad code and making it better. And we'll introduce this concept of collective ownership where we need to ensure no one feels they shouldn't change code. Oh, I shouldn't work on that piece of code because Fred wrote that code. I should leave this story for Fred. With collective ownership, no one should ever feel that they shouldn't change code, that we absolutely have to ensure that we have confidence to pick up any piece of code because modules will be updated many, many times through a Scrum project because each story is a small incremental change to a module and therefore this principle of collective ownership is critical to making sure we can proceed and move forward throughout the rapid progression of the stories in our Scrum project. And the first of these techniques is test-driven development. And I would say personally, I would say this is the most recommended. And this is most recommended by Steve personally is not necessarily the most recommended of approaches through most Scrum Agile techniques, but it is very highly recommended. And it's so highly recommended because it tends to produce the best defined and verifiable code. We do test-driven development because we want to deliver quality. And the very principle of test-driven development is directly related to quality. And that's because the very first thing we do is we write the test case. Well, not the very first thing we do. We pick up our story, we go have our conversation with the product owner, we do the 10 minutes of analysis, we do the 15 minutes of design, but before we start coding, we write the test case. And we don't just write a test case, we write all test cases. We absolutely define 100% the criteria that we're going to achieve to satisfy the what is done. And again, I'm not saying we write the test cases in English. I'm saying we write the real test cases, preferably the automated test cases. 100% test driven development. We write the test case first, and then we write the code, and we write very focused code that says, I need to write code that's going to ensure that test case number one is satisfied and we write focused code that does nothing but ensuring the test case passes. And you may find that really almost self-serving. Well, as a developer, if all I'm doing is writing code to ensure that I pass my test cases, how am I ensuring that I'm satisfying the business requirements? Well, we do that because we have to ensure the test cases re satisfy the business requirements. 
And if we focus on writing good, complete, reliable, and preferably automated test cases, and then we focus on ensuring that we write only the code, nothing but the code that is required to pass the test cases, then in fact, I believe we have well-defined and well-verifiable code. Research has proven that test-driven development has a dramatic impact on quality. Test-driven development is going to reduce the number of defects anywhere in the range of 40 to 100 percent. At the extreme, 100 percent improvement in the number of defects in the code. That's a pretty incredible, that's a pretty impressive number, something I believe any project team would be should be focused on, would be proud to deliver. Even at the lower range, 40% of improvement in codes, or, or rounding that up a little bit, almost half as many defects in the code that my Scrum project produces over any other code that's written. That's, a, again, a pretty impressive figure. And why is this achievable? It's because we're writing the code to pass the test cases, which to me means we're writing only the code necessary. Again, there's no embellishment. There's no value adding. We're focusing on writing only the code and nothing but the code to pass the test cases. And as I say, we ensure that we're satisfying the story requirements because we're writing the right test cases and we're going through the peer review. So again, Steve highly recommends test-driven development. If you haven't embarked on test-driven development, I think it's well worth taking out and I'm going to be corny for a test drive, but focus on using test-driven development in your projects, specifically in your Scrum projects, because that's what this nugget is focused on, but any project where you're writing code, consider how having test-driven development, writing the test cases first, will absolutely drive value into your project. And our next Agile technique is pair programming. And pair programming is probably the most commonly known and the most contentious. There's a lot of benefits, there's a lot of value of using pair programming on your Scrum project, but I will be the first to say pair programming is not mandatory. It's not mandatory. I think it's a good idea. I use it where appropriate on projects, but I do not require all development be, to be done in a pair process. There will be some code that is of such a simplistic nature or even some code that is of such a complex nature that pair programming may not be appropriate. There may be some code that requires unique skills and those unique skills are truly locked in a single person. So there's lots of reasons why to not pair program. But there's also a lot of good reasons why to pair program. And in this particular segment, I'm going to focus on why we should be pair programming and leave it to you to make your own determinations of when, where, if, and why pair programming is going to be appropriate on your Scrum project. And I think it's summed up with two heads in a pair programming fashion are absolutely better than two heads. And what am I trying to say by that? If you have two people working on the same piece of code, their performance, their throughput, their quality is greater by a substantial factor than if you had those same two people working on two different stories. So let's, let's again assume that we have two programmers working on two two story point stories. Let's make a whole bunch of twos in here just to make it, I hope, simpler. And in theory, at the end of two story points worth of work, 
our two programmers should have produced two complete stories. Two story points of time. And that's pretty simple math. In a pair programming fashion, because two heads are better than one, you're going to get better performance, better throughput, better quality, if you have two programmers working in a pair on two story points worth of stories after two story points of time you will have both stories done and a new story started or you will have both stories done and zero defects to be discovered in the code Again, hard to explain until you see it in action, but absolutely pair programming is where two heads working together collaboratively are better, will produce more results than two developers working on two stories independently. They will either get more work done in the same unit of time, or they will absolutely deliver higher quality code across the same unit of time. And why? Pair programming is a self-correcting process. Pair programming is all about one person doing the code and the other person looking over their shoulder and validating. The validation, the looking over the shoulder can be as simple as you made a coding error there. That's not an appropriate construct within the coding language that we're using. And it's caught instantly while the fingers are still on the keyboard as opposed to when it's submitted for a compile. Pair programming is self-correcting because the person looking over the shoulders, being the writer, is going to say, I think you grabbed the wrong variable name. You shouldn't be year of birth. We should be using day of birth for this particular calculation because the person doing the oversight, doing that, that passenger aspect, is able to focus on what is being done, not the mechanics of doing it. And the next key benefit of pair programming is long term you have better knowledge sharing because you have two people on one piece of code. Obviously, I think it goes without saying, both people understand that piece of code. So in story number one, Fred and Sally worked on module one. Three weeks later, in the next sprint, we have another story that requires work on module number one. We don't have to have both Fred and Sally assigned to the new story in the next sprint, but if either Fred or Sally pick up that module for the next story, they have direct intimacy with that module, and therefore there is absolutely better knowledge sharing across the team. You have far more flexibility, you have far more freedom, you have far more interest in having people pick up stories directly related to priority as opposed to the team member saying, oh, I want to work on those three stories because I know that piece of code and so on and so on. So it absolutely facilitates better knowledge sharing, which directly again will result in better code because there's less learning curve, there's less assumptions made. How do we implement driver or pair programming? There's two common methods. One is called the driver rider or driver passenger, as I've referred to already. The driver is the person with the keyboard. And the driver is the person writing the code. If day of birth is greater than et cetera, et cetera, and the rider is validating all of the keystrokes that the driver is doing, oh, I don't think that's a valid coding construct in this programming language. Oh, I think that you've picked the wrong variable. And more importantly, that writer is looking ahead. So after we satisfy this date of birth edit, the next thing we need to do is, and that's the key point, the writer is looking ahead. And the writer says, the next thing we need to do is, the second that the driver completes the edit on the date of birth, we switch. And the writer says, OK, now I know what we need to do next. Pass the keyboard over to me and let me add it. In which case, the roles reverse. And the, the person who was the writer 
starts to write the code and the driver or the person who was the driver starts to look over their shoulder and do the validation and the looking ahead. So as soon as this second switch completes the next line of code, again, the person who was the passenger is looking ahead. Okay, now I know what we need to do and we switch back again and on and on and on. So the driver rider principle in pair programming is intended to be shifted on a regular basis. This is not a student mentor relationship. This is not where one person does all of the driving and one person does all of the overlooking. This is absolutely a participatory shared activity and we expect the team to frequently, and it can be as frequently as writing a line of code to complete an edit. It can be as frequently as completing a, a, a component of code that satisfies a major function of the story. It's shifting when and where appropriate based on the activities that those two team members are working on. But the expectation is we absolutely switch the driver rider role frequently as part of completing a single story. And then when that story is completed, there's a high expectation that the driver rider, that the pair combination will change, that Fred and Sally are no longer working on the story. Fred picks up a new story and teams with Betty and Sally picks up a new story and teams with Ralph. Very much involved with getting two people with a common interest on a piece of code working on it and then collaboratively working on it. And another very, very common approach for implementing pair programming, especially if you're using, I shouldn't say especially, only if you're using test-driven development, is the first person writes the first test case. Here is the test case required to complete this function of the story. And then the other pair writes the code that satisfies the test case. So one person, I'm going to use the word dreams up the test case, and the next person writes the code to satisfy the test case. And then immediately, while they still have their fingers on the keyboard, creates the next test case and passes it back to the person to write the code to satisfy their test case and so on and so on and so on. So just another very valid concept of how your team members can partner together to implement pair programming. As I said, well worth some consideration. My focus here is on why we should be pairing. And I hope I've given you enough compelling reasons of why we should be, com should be pairing. But don't be compelled to, don't feel that you have to 100% use pair programming at all times. There's lots of good reasons to use pair programming and there's some equally good reasons of why not to use pair programming. And one final consideration I will give you for pair programming is it absolutely requires adequate space. The desk space needs to be large. There has to be enough room to pass the keyboard back and forth. And there has to be enough room that two people can share this common workspace without any sense of invasion of privacy. If you have a very private person who has, you know, the, the, the 18 inch to 24 inch of personal space, we need to find an environment where pair programming can happen, that that person, the introvert, has the ability to maintain their own personal private space, but still has adequate workspace to allow pair programming to, to exist. So again, there is some effort on our part as Scrum Masters to remove all of the roadblocks to pair programming, but I believe there's equally valid reasons of why as Scrum Masters we want to introduce and we want to encourage and we want to support pair programming in our Scrum projects. And our next agile technique is refactoring. And we spent a lot of time on refactoring in the previous nugget. So I'm not going to spend a lot of time on here, but I added it in this particular section because it is a key agile principle development technique. And I believe is critical to use in Scrum projects. And we know refactoring is all about taking bad code and making it better. How do we make it better? We rewrite complex code. And we break it down into more structured code. We add better documentation. 
we remove complex nested if statements. We do whatever else it is that our developers believe is required to take this bad code and make it better. And why do we make it better? Because we want it to be more resilient for future change. We have an expectation that this code is going to be reused and we want to make sure that this code is prepared for reuse. Now, one may say, building code that's resilient for future change doesn't sound very agile. Agile is focused on just enough work doing the bare minimum required to satisfy the story. So if this particular piece of code satisfies the current story, therefore it should be complete as is. And that's the truth. If it satisfies the story, it's good. So why do we want to refactor? Because it satisfies the story, but it could be buggy. Yes, our scrum principle is do just enough to get the job done, but our scrum principle is also to deliver quality. And the fact that we have technology debt in our code is the enemy of quality. So therefore, we do build in this little bit of resilience for future change with the focus for improving quality. We do refactoring with confidence because we have automated testing. We know today the build works. If we check out the module and we refactor the module, and when we're refactoring, our focus is purely on taking bad code and making it better, we don't have a story, we don't have stated business requirements, we don't have new functionality we're trying to implement, all we're trying to do is take in bad code and make it better. Before we started, the build works and it's automated testing, we do our refactor, we make better code, we check it in, and we do a build, and if we get a green light, then we know our refactoring was successful because we took the bad code and we made it better. And the build is still functioning, so therefore the functionality of the code remains. So the key to refactoring is we do it with confidence because we have the automated testing to validate that the code changed for the refactoring satisfies the, the intended business intent. The focus for the code remains the same. Our next agile development technique is this principle of collective ownership. And summed up, no one should own a piece of code. There's no more that this is Fred's code. Fred wrote the code originally. Fred modified it in Sprint 5 and modified it again in Sprint 10, and here we are in Sprint 15, and therefore the only person who can modify this code is Fred, because Fred owns that piece of code. Because Scrum is high volume stories, and I will explain what I mean by high volume stories, it has high throughput, Each story is small, and therefore each story has a likelihood of changing existing code. And that's why I say we have a high volume of stories. We need many, many stories to implement a single full business process, and each story is likely to incrementally build on existing pieces of code and therefore in order for scrum principles with this high volume story concept to work it's absolutely critical that no one that fred doesn't feel ownership for this piece of code it's okay for fred to create the code but mary has to have confidence to pick it up in sprint number five and sally 
has to have equal confidence to pick up the code that both Fred and Mary worked on and change it in Sprint 10 and so on and so on as the module, as the code progresses through this principle of high volume stories. Pair programming, as we've already discussed, encourages collective ownership because instantly with a pair, we have at least two people. We have Fred and Mary initially owning the piece of code. And as I discussed a few moments ago, when we need to modify that piece of code, the fact that Mary already has knowledge of it is awesome. But again, Fred and Mary should not be the owners. Ideally, Mary and Sally could work on the code in 15 or Sprint 5, and Sally and Ralph could work on it in Sprint 10. But equally appropriate, Sally and Ralph could pick up the code that Fred and Mary worked on and modify it in, in sprint number five. Again, the principle is no one owns the piece of code. Pair programming strongly encourages the lack of ownership of code, but even without pair programming, collective ownership is a principle we should be trying to introduce into our Scrum projects. Another piece of strong encouragement for collective ownership is enforcing strong peer reviews and ensuring that peer reviews are equally shared so that again we don't always have Mary peer reviewing Fred's code when Fred is ready for a peer review Fred should simply stick up his hand and says I have code I have test cases I have design I have something that needs to be peer reviewed who has the time and the interest of doing a peer review for me and anyone does it, which again supports the principle of better knowledge sharing. So there's lots of things we can do in Scrum development to encourage collective ownership. And I believe the key thing that's going to support collective ownership, again, is this principle of automated testing. Just as automated testing gives us the confidence to refactor ruthlessly for that matter, Automated testing should also provide us the confidence that I can pick up Fred's code and modify it in Sprint 5, recognizing that I am focused on making the changes to introduce the story requirements in Sprint 5, and the automated testing is going to validate that my changes didn't undo any of the work that Fred did, and I add my mo additional testing so that later when Mary picks up my changes in Sprint 10, we have the automated tests that covers both Fred's and Steve's work, and then Mary adds in her own. So lots of good support in a Scrum world to move towards this principle of collective ownership. And as I suggested, I believe collective ownership is probably one principle that I would enforce on my projects simply because we want to ensure that there is the ability for the next available person to pick up the code, that there's no holding stories hostage, waiting for Fred to have the time to work on the stories unique to his piece of code. This concludes our nugget on agile development techniques. In this nugget, we focus first on test-driven development where we write the test case first, and then we write the code to validate to make the test case pass. And the beauty of test-driven development is it ensures quality, it reduces defects, and I believe absolutely supports the Scrum principle of doing just enough code to satisfy the requirement. We discussed pair programming where two heads one piece of code where one codes and the other inspects. Again, with the principle of ensuring higher quality code is developed, we introduce the concept of refactoring, of taking bad code and making it better. And finally, in this nugget, we introduce collective ownership where we want to ensure no one has any concerns about changing any code. There should be no ownership. 
Fred should not be considered the owner of a piece of code simply because Fred was the original author. With automated testing and appropriate peer reviews and even better pair programming, there should be absolute confidence with anyone on your project picking up any piece of code. Our next nugget will continue exploring other agile techniques that I recommend be considered as part of your Scrum project. This concludes our first nugget on agile development techniques. I hope this module has been informative for you and thank you very much for viewing.